So now we're going to cover uh, bonds payable when using the effective interest method. In the previous lecture, we talked about the straight line method, and now we're going to go into the second acceptable method under US GAAP, the effective interest method. As an overview, um, one important concept from the straight line method that we have to understand is that the total interest expense is equal to the total interest payments plus the discount. And so if we kind of think about that, um, when we use the uh, straight line method, we had the contractual interest payment and then we had the amortization of the discount every single period. But in total, the total interest expense was the sum of the two. And at the same time, if it was a premium, the total interest expense over the life of the bond was the total interest payments minus the premium. And of course, every single period, we had the amortization of the premium, the contractual interest payment, and the interest expense was basically the difference between the two. And so we can see with each period that the three work cooperatively, and in total, they also do. And so what's the implication with this idea for the effective interest method? First of all, the total amount of interest paid and the total interest expense is the same under both methods. So there's no difference in those two totals. And the reason why is because the, the contractual interest payments and the price, they don't change. Um, however, the timing of the interest expense will be different because of the amor because the amortization method is different. So it's very important to understand that when we're talking about straight line method or effective interest method that we're talking about the way that we're amortizing the discount or premium. Again, so the effective interest and straight line methods are methods that we use to amortize the discount or premium. Now, because we're using the effective interest method, this is a little different than the straight line method, we actually do need to solve for the bond yield. And so because of that, there's a little more calculation when it comes to the effective interest method. All right, here's an example. Banther Company issues $250,000 of five-year annual bonds. The bonds have a rate of 6.5%, and they pay interest on December 31st each year. The bonds are issued at 96. So we need to provide the journal entries for 2018 and for the bond maturity date on 12-31-2022. The first thing we're gonna calculate is the issue price, or the cash that's received at issuance. And we're given a price of 96, which means that the price is 96% of the face value, or the par value, for a total of 240,000. Regardless of whether we're using the effective interest method or the straight line method, the way that we calculate the price is exactly the same. And so that initial entry, we can see that the bond payable has a par value of 250,000. The cash proceeds are 240,000. And of course that difference then is a discount on the bonds payable. Now, as we move through time, we start recording the payments. We do need to record the contractual interest payment. The rate is 6.5%. We apply that to the par value, which means that each payment is $16,250. And so we use that information. Like we said before, we need to solve for the yield because we're gonna use the yield in order to determine the amount of amortization each period. And so in this case, it's a five-year annual bond. So the number of periods is five. The present value is the price, and the price that we received was 240000 The contractual interest payments is 16250 And then finally, at maturity, the par value is 250000 That's the principal that will be repaid at maturity. And so with this information then, we solve for the yield, and we get 7.4884%. And as expected, if you think back to the first lecture on long-term uh, long liabilities, uh, because this was issued at a discount, it means that the market rate, discount rate, or the bond yield must be more than contractual rate. And so you see in this case, the contractual rate is 6.5% and the bond yield is 7.4884%. So we're going to use the information from the TVM in order to create an amortization table there are two pieces or two columns that I want to uh, specifically talk about. Number one is the interest expense is going to be the bond yield, which we just solved for, and we're going to apply that to the carrying value. I'm going to show you how we do that. But this is important in calculating the interest expense. And so the amortization 
uh, under the effective interest method is the difference between what we record as interest expense and what we have as a contractual interest payment. So the amortization is the difference between the two. So we can see on January 1st, 2018, that the initial carrying value is $240,000. Then as we work through time, we see that the first payment would be 1231-2018. The contractual payment is 16,250, which we calculated. The interest expense is that yield, that 7.4884%, applied to the carrying value of $240,000. And so 17,792 is the product of those two items. The amortization is the difference between our interest payment and the interest expense. And then we have a new carrying value. And I want to talk a little bit about the new carrying value. Notice that the amount of amortization is added to the previous carrying value. If you think conceptually, economically, we've incurred an expense of $17,792. That's essentially our interest obligation that we incur over the year. However, we only pay $16,250. And so because we do not pay our full obligation, the carrying value of the bond must increase. In other words, our total liabilities increase because not only do we owe the initial carrying value, but now we also owe the unpaid interest. And that process will continue throughout the life of the bond. And so all the way through 1231-2022, which is the bond maturity date, you can see that the carrying value continues to increase as the interest expense continues to be more than the interest that we're paying. Again, this is just economically going, what's going on beyond the, behind the scenes. Um, our contractual interest payment is fixed at $16,250. And so the amortization process is just accounting for the discount. And basically, how do we amortize the discount over the life of the bond. So now we're going to use the amortization table in order to generate our journal entries. And you can see the first journal entry is 1231 2018. We have a payment of 16,250, the interest expense of 17,972, and the amortization of the discount for the difference. And so we put that all into our journal entry. Of course, the cash payment is a credit. The amortization of the discount is a credit. And then the interest expense is the debit. Again, we do have the interest expense directly calculated uh, from the amortization table. Um, but if you think conceptually, really what it is, is the amortization method for the discount and the cash payment together give us the interest expense. So for the next year, 1231-2019, you can see the approach is the same, but the amounts are going to slightly change. Again, the cash payment is still fixed at $16,250. The amortization of the discount is now $18,101. I'm sorry, is, is now $1,851. Those together give us the interest expense of $18,101. And then finally, if we take it all the way out to maturity, our final entry is going to be a little different because not only do we have to make the last interest payment, but we also must record the repayment of the par value. And so the uh, bonds payable, of course, gets debited because that bond is being paid off. The cash payment is not only the $16,250 interest payment, but it's also paying the par value of $250,000 for a total of $266,000. $260, $266,250 payment. The amortization of the discount is $2,299. And so from that, we again infer our interest expense of $18,549.